You're listening to The Whole Truth, a Resources Rising Stars podcast. The Whole Truth podcast is about to hit the road with Greenvale Energy. I'm Paul Armstrong. Greenvale specialises in bitumen. Yes, I just saw your eyes glaze over right there and then. One would say, why would I invest in bitumen? Could you give me anything more boring? And that's exactly the point we make on this podcast. Mark tells us all about why the company is going to be Australia's only supplier of the key ingredient in bitumen, a little oil called torbonite. It gives off that lovely smell that we're all familiar with when we see a new road being laid. In addition to bitumen, the company is also planning to drill wells in the Northern Territory to look for helium. We're not talking helium just for use in those balloons that you all love to make your voice squeaky. We're talking helium that has a whole lot of scientific leading edge applications throughout things like MRI machines and the like. The market's soaring, the price is soaring, and again, the company's in a great position to develop an asset with a difference. Mark's passionate about what he does. Yes, you can be passionate about bitumen, and I think you will be too after you've heard this podcast. The chairman is Neil Biddle, the man behind the great Pilbara Minerals lithium development. He sees things coming before most people. Neil thinks he's on another winner. Listen to the podcast and see what you think. Mark, the share price has been running. Why? I think he's off the buck of bringing in our new three-way play um, in the Amadeus Basin. Um, it's a great opportunity for the business. And, yeah, I think the market's supposed to is seeing that. When you say the, the basin, though, let's put people in the, in the picture of what you do. This, this company, Greenvale, says we're in the business or we're going to be in the business of bitumen. But you can't mine bitumen. No, well, Bitchman for rules is um, we've got a mine site that's in Alpha, which is um, probably about a two hour drive from Emerald, just give people perspective of about where it's located. And um, the turbinite and the canalite that we have is very shallow, it's only around 50 meters deep. So it's more of a quarry than a mine site. So, so what is turbinite? Turbinite's an oil shale. So turbinite and canalite, which we have, if you were to look at them, you'd probably go, well, that's a coal, but it's not. It's an oil shale. So what you do with it is you basically, we're using a liquefaction process, which means you had hydrogen as a pressure. You can use a carrier oil and you heat it up slowly to around 400 degrees. It breaks down, it's blended, it's mixed up. And then at the end of the process, you take out your carrier oil and you're left with a heavy oil. And that heavy crude oil contains asphaltines, and asphaltines is what gives you your bitumen binding products. Right, so so let's put this in the terms that people are familiar with. You look at bitumen on the road, you see it being laid, that smell that comes off it, is that emanating from the oil? Yes. So that is actually what you call torbonite in simple terms, that you're going to produce the binds, the gravel and the stones and all That's the rest it. together to make what we know as bitumen or tar. That's it. The bitumen binding products, the bitumen products go get blended with other products and stones and other things, and that produces your asphalt, asphalt things. I mean, so your, your asphalt, so let's go on to your road. So, so do you plan to sell the torbonite or do you plan to mix it with the stones and the gravel and all the other lovely goodies and mm. say, here's bitumen? No, we just, we're going to sell the bitumen binding products. So we're expecting, we'll know more in the coming months of what products we've got. Ready uh, to lay? Um, no, it will go still to go to a refinery, and then the refinery, um, it'll be blended with other things to be used, asphalt, asphalt that goes onto the road. There's a lot of roads in Australia now. No one's producing torbonite. No. Where does it come from? So it's a byproduct of heavy crude oil. So at the moment in Australia, you've got oil refineries in Geelong and Gladstone. They're both like crude oil. So we're not producing heavy crude oil in Australia. Um, so it all comes from overseas. So somewhere like, for example, China, they have ref- big heavy crude oil refineries. Um, the Bishman becomes a byproduct for them. They put it on oil tankers and then they ship it across the world to us, heated up at 240 degrees, producing a lot of emissions. So all the all the roads in Australia are made from imported torbonite. Yeah. Well, not torbonite, heavy crude oil. Heavy crude oil. Heavy crude oil. Torbonite is a specialist just for us. And we've got the only torbonite reserve that's commercially in the world that we're aware of. So So the the long and the short of this is Greenvale Energy is saying, hey, we've got a source of this key torbonite oil Mm. and we could become a domestic supplier of the key ingredient to make roads, to make bitumen, and we'll be the only one. Correct. So it'll be an import replacement yeah. industry. That's right. We'll, we'll be the only end-to-end producer. 
So it's a ready-made market, to say the least. G- yeah. Guaranteed market. I, I assume that you can supply this. Tell us about the prices and the money. What can shareholders expect to see you make? Because obviously you're not importing this from overseas. There must be some savings. Then production costs of bitumen produced using Greenvale Torbonite presumably is lower than using an imported product. That's right. I mean, if you look at the market at the moment, we use C170 as a as a benchmark. And the reason we do that is because that's the easiest one to get readily available off the market. So, for example, Queensland Department of Transport every month release what the price of C-170 bitumen is that month. So this month it was around $1,500 a tonne. And now that, again, takes into account that it's come from overseas, it's a lot of shitting costs. Um, we'll know more in the next few months of what exactly different types of bitumen products we've got. There's rejuvenating bitumen, for example, which is very environmentally friendly, where basically you take the first inch off the current road it comes off, it goes in, and then it's blended with a rejuvenator and then relayed. There's a high possibility we could have that, um, which would be great. But we won't know until the next few months. We've sent it, um, a couple of bulk samples over to Technique in New Zealand, who are bitumen experts. Um, they'll play around with it. They'll come back and say, you've got this and that. And then what they'll also do as well is give us some ideas of what we can do. Because once you've got a bitumen binding product, it just doesn't mean you can stay at that product. You can then do further processing and produce different products. And that's what we'll know more of in the coming so months. So you're doing this in the form of a pre-feasibility study that's almost complete? Yes. So we've gone through three testing regimes already. Um, the first testing regime was to see if the liquefaction process worked. The second one we did, we took it up to around 340 degrees. And that was the limit of what we had with our consultants program with Air Power Reactor. Um, so then we engage the University of Jordan. Um, what we've seen is from going from test program two to test program three is an increase of 72% in yield. Now we've engaged the University of Monash in Melbourne um, and they'll replicate what was done by the Jordanians, um, but they're going to be using core sample where the Jordanians use outcrop. So we're expecting to see better results. And then we've also engaged Lysella, who are based down in New South Wales, who are looking at supercritical water. So the, the advantages of going with supercritical water is, is that it's a lot more environmentally friendly and the capital costs associated using um, supercritical a lot less as well. So we're, again, we've just done three lots of samples with them. They've just completed two. And then we've sent those samples off to Petrolab in Melbourne, and we'll be waiting for the results for them in the coming months. So if you think you can produce bitumen at a final cost that's lower than councils and main road departments and the like are paying mm. currently to import it, mm. presumably there's a good margin here no matter which route you go down. Oh, there'll be very good margin for us, yeah. Um, it's can you a, give us some back of the envelopes? Any, any I examples? I can't really because until we've got an actual product certified, it'd be wrong of me to say what the actual costs are and how much we're going to make. Um, but it. But you have no competitors. We don't. Only, we don't. only international competitors. No, so, so there's a lot of companies out there, end users like Coral, Boral, um, Coral, sorry, Boral and Fulton Hogan, for example, who are very keen, to, um, you know, to work with us because they're the ones that want the product. And how much of it comes from China at the moment? What sort of percentage of the, of the supply? Um, I think it's around about 30% at the moment, and then... So dare I say it, are you, are you going to tell me that bitumen's about to become a critical mineral? You're, not, well. you're going to put your hand up for some of Elbow's $4, million, $4 billion? Well, the biggest concern at the moment is is um, the price of oil. It's like the price of oil is going up and up and up, and it doesn't seem to be stopping. And with the what's going on in the Middle East at the moment, um, potentially it's going to get higher and higher. So the cost of importing bitumen is going to significantly increase over the... Now, there's a geopolitical risk here too, isn't there? I mean, as you rightly say, a chunk of it comes from the Middle East. Plenty of reasons to be concerned about the reliability of supply there at the moment. China gets caught up in the whole China geopacific yep. ding-dong there. Okay. So when you, when you put it all together, you'd have to say you, you're offering the prospect of a local-made product that brings security or supply... In an in a area or a product that is somewhat crucial to uh, That's right. daily life, isn't it? Yeah, we've got a small event happening in Brisbane soon, the Olympics, and there's going to be a lot of infrastructure spending. So I, I think the demand for bitumen at the moment is going to just continue to increase, increase, and the government have their 
rural roads projects where they're looking to improve the local rural roads out there. Um, they're in pretty bad condition at the moment, having been out there and drove on a few of them. As some of your uh, fellow Englishmen would say, couldn't you Adam and Eve it? Bitumen's <laughs> about to become a critical mineral. <laughs> it's getting close to. <laughs> it's a licence to print money, isn't it? You'll be the only producer in Australia. You're going one way or the other, you're going to be making fat margins. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a nice position to be in. There are, excuse the pun, but it's a road to riches, isn't it? It could well be. And hopefully a green road as well. Wow. Now, now, there's also a bit of uh, some steak knives in the Greenvale offering, isn't there? Because while you're working up the Torbanite, let's call it bitumen, mm. the bitumen prospect, you're talking in the background about uh, drilling a gas field that you think could have helium in it. That's right. So the Amadeus Basin has got a proven track record of this. So all you have to do is look at a couple of the... So it's the same basin that hosts the Torbanite? No, different basin. So um, Amadeus Basin is in the Northern Territory. Alpha is in Queensland. So with the Amadeus Basin, there's um, a lot of uh, local infrastructure already out there. And we've got Santos and Central Petroleum just adjacent to us um, with their marine oil and gas fields. Um, and what we can look at um, historically is what's been drilled. So if you look at one of the wells, Mount Kitty, for example, um, what we're seeing from there is 9% helium and around 11% hydrogen. And then also you've got about 34% so you, natural gas as well. So this suggestion that you make that your field could contain helium is based on those nearby to you. That's right. So we've got data there to go and look at and see that it exists. In, there is helium there, which is great. Now, put, put us all out of our misery. We all know that helium is pretty much used to put into balloons, which then some naughty kids suck out and gives them a squeak, squeaky voice. It must have some more commercial uses than that. It does. It does. So let's say a couple of things that everyone knows. MRI machines. So every MRI machine uses 700 litres of helium a year. So just think about how many of them there is in Australia and how many there is around the world. Semiconductors, again, um, area of space. Um, it's used in so many things that you wouldn't you wouldn't believe. So the the helium market's huge. So at the moment it's about six billion cubic feet. That's what they measure it in BCFs. Um, the demand for the world at the moment is around six BCF, and over the coming years it's going to go up to around ten BCF. So the market year on year is increasing, semiconductors, fiber optics, um, MRI, everything, all that industries are increasing year on year by about 8 10%, some even more. So what we're seeing is the demand going up, but the supply is actually coming down. So, so where are you up to in terms of trying to ascertain whether your, your field or your reservoir contains gas so, and or helium? So the first thing to do is go out and do 2D seismic. The reason you do 2D seismic, it will tell you exactly where to drill. So it gives you a better indication of where's the best part. And what we want to do is drill in a location that will give us an indication of the three-way play. So what the, the plan is at the moment is complete 2D seismic by middle of next year. And then once we've identified a drill location, going to drill in as soon as possible. You don't know when you'll spud that well? Um, I'm hoping early 25, if we can get the 2D seismic completed by mid next year and then go through the approvals pathway um, and then hopefully early next year. I mean, early gas discoveries are fantastic, obviously, for investors and there's been some vast wealth made out of successful gas wells. But, of course, A, they're, they're, they can be hit and miss, of course, and they're very long time frames, as you say. Even mm. here you're talking about, you know, 2025 to spud a well. Mm. But is the investment pitch here for Greenvale that you've probably got one of the most reliable scenarios on your hands, producing bitumen, no local competitors, mm. selling mm. it to a ready-made market mm. that, that needs the product. It uh, hasn't got any choice. It's, um, it's what you might call, the economists would call, inelastic demand. You need yeah. it, it has to be there. Uh, relatively straightforward proposition, you would think. And then the cream on the cake is we're going to drill these wells, and this well, and if it comes in well, mm. We're all off to the races. That's right. And if you look at the moment, um, the helium market in Australia, you've got Darwin LNG. They're the only ones producing helium in Australia, and they're about, they'll be shutting down over the next few years. So then what that means is you won't have um, a domestic source of helium. It means you've got to import it from overseas again. And what you do then is import liquid helium. So if you look at the market at the moment for um a contracted um, helium, it's measured in thousands of cubic feet, MCF, 
Um, you're looking between $415 and $500 per MCF at the moment for a contracted price. If you're looking at spot pricing, you're looking around $950 to $1,000 in spot pricing. Now, if you then have to convert it to liquid helium, you're talking between $1,000 and $3,000 per MCF. Now, Australia's looking down the barrel of having to play that soon once the LNG plant and it shuts down in Darwin. An outsider might look at this first blush and say, gee, bitumen and helium, unusual bedfellows. But in fact, on closer analysis, obviously they're both petroleum products. So there's, yep. a, there's a synergy there. And they're both in Australia, neighbouring yep. states. And uh, in fact, they're complementary to the extent that one is a relatively short to medium proposition, relatively low risk in the scheme of you know mm. resources development projects. Mm. As we say, ready-made market. Uh, no domestic competitors. It's as these things go. It's it's a pretty straightforward proposition. And then you bring in the steak knives. That somewhere down the track we're going to drill this well, and if it comes in, well, hold on to your hats. Yeah, exactly right. I think you some for a market well cap there. of what? What what do you get this exposure for? What, well, so at the moment, our market cap, our market cap's around forty million dollars at the moment. We're trading around eleven cents. So it's it's an absolute bargain at the moment. Where you think about. The, where the business is going to be going and the revenue associated with our products, our projects, so it's, it's, it's a really great opportunity now, for investors. Now, you have a chairman who's got a bit of experience in creating wealth for shareholders, Mr Neil Biddle, who I think well known to many of our listeners as the founder of Pilbara Minerals, among other things, the, the lithium giant. What's Neil's view, view of all this? He's very excited. I mean, he hired me and he... In the interview process, when he interviewed me and sold me the Alpha project, and that's what brought me on board. He was his passion for the project, the potential of it, and where it's going. And when he, again, Neil through his contracts, um, bought the helium, the freeway opportunity to us as well. And I'm an oil and gas guy myself, 20 plus years of in the industry. Um, so I know this industry very well. And when he brought this one to us, it was it was too good to refuse. It's an absolutely fantastic opportunity for the business and shareholders. I mean, Neil Biddle does have great foresight, doesn't he? I remember in the early days, he him pitching Pilbara when the share price was about two odd cents, and he was actually telling people that there was this uh, going to be this big push to things called lithium batteries and electric vehicles, and the key ingredient was lithium, and they had a lot of lithium up in the Pilbara, and mm. and uh, it could be could be quite valuable. Now he was ahead of his time, and of course. History yeah. shows that he was a quite a pioneer in that industry in Australia, and and the people who who followed him, his his disciples in the Pilbara, um, did very very well. He's playing the same game here, isn't he? He's saying, hey, this is this isn't going to happen in the next five minutes, but uh, it is going to happen, and when it does happen, there's going to be substantial sums made along the way. That's exactly right. I mean, the helium play. There's a big helium market at the moment, but the demand for it's going higher and higher. And if you look at hydrogen, we all know. At the moment, the hydrogen market is going to come. So in the next five years, there's going to be you know, probably a hydrogen out there um, in Gladstone. Um, I think that hydrogen makes sense in Australia um, because of the distances we have to travel. So electric vehicle, heavy goods vehicles, I don't think will work. If you've got a helium um, trucks, and uh, it works. And you only have to look over to Europe or look at the UK, all the buses and everything in the UK now are helium. So the technology's there. I think it's So there's another about- element of complementary assets, isn't there? It, 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 you've, got, you've got the road and, you, and you've got the helium that powers the bus that drives on the road. Exactly. The, yeah, hydrogen. Yeah, the hydrogen. <laughs> yeah, that powers the bus. Exactly. They complement each other. And, um, you know, the, the hydrogen industry is great. And what, what we've got is natural hydrogen. It's considered like gold hydrogen because it's naturally. You're not, you're not having to produce it. So everyone talks about hydrogen. They mainly talk about green hydrogen, which you have to manufacture. You have to produce it. So you have an electrolyzer, and then you have a renewable energy source. And that renewable energy source produces, um, uh, goes through the electro, powers the electrolyzer, which in then turn produces hydrogen, which is very costly. And that's the reason that the hydrogen market at this stage hasn't really took off because of the cost associated with it. So, so what's what's the next share price catalyst here? Just to wrap up here, it's uh, is it the PFS? On, yeah, on the I think that's so. what I it's think, all about. Yeah, I think over the next few months we're going to have some fantastic news. We've got our resource um, upgrade coming out 
in, in a short time. So that will increase our resource from 18.6 million tonnes, what we have at the moment. And then over the coming week, over the coming months, we'll be releasing the results from Lysila and Monash. And then all building up to the big one, which will be the uh, PFS that will come out Q1 next year. And I think it'll probably be at the right time with the current market for it to come out as well. Uh, bringing it out of this market at the moment probably be wasted. So I think that it's been a blessing that we've been delayed to some re- to some degree. So well, we look forward to the arrival of the PFS. It's a it's a fascinating story, certainly one with a difference. I think uh, the uh, the Torbanite, or or rather, should we just call it the Bitumen story, is in many respects a pretty straight up story. And uh, there's obviously a few hurdles to jump as you go along, but the, you can see it is a. Uh, as we say, a road to riches, if indeed you can prove that this will work, um, which you obviously seem very confident about, as you wouldn't have got to PFS stage, and there's a ready-made market. Mark, thanks very much for your time. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to The Whole Truth, a Resources Rising Stars podcast, produced by Resource Media, hosted by Paul Armstrong for Red Corporate. Please note that Reed Corporate does not provide investment advice and investors should seek personalised advice before making any investment decisions.